thank you so much, Mitchell. And thank all of you guys for being here. We really could not do this without all of you being a member of our community and showing up and supporting us. So thank you so much. You are what makes all of this possible. So I'm super excited to be able to start today by talking about Vault. Uh, we open sourced it about two and a half years ago. Uh, and few people know that it started life as an internal project. It really started for us looking at how we solve our own secret management problem. Uh, and in sort of talking with users, talking with customers about the challenges they're facing, they really convinced us that this is software that we should open source, that there's actually this much bigger problem uh, with the way we think about and handle modern sort of infrastructure security, and that Vault can play a pivotal role here. Role here. And so over the last two and a half years, what we've seen is an incredibly broad adoption of Vault, honestly, much, much more so than we even expected ourselves when we opened it. And I think the lesson for us is that modern security software is becoming much more important than ever before. And so the question for us when we started trying to understand this was, what's really changing? Why is this happening now that all of a sudden there's this sort of renewed focus and, and sort of uh, excitement around things like Vault? And I think it really goes back to what's changing about how we think about network security, how we think about application security. When we kind of look at the way we used to do it, it used to be sort of this castle and moat approach. Uh, we had these fortified walls that were the outside of our data center. We had a single drawbridge, which was our ingress and egress. And we layered our firewall and our intrusion detection system and our web application firewall and all of this sort of network-based middleware uh, that provided the security. And then we said, once you're inside that castle, everything is safe, right? We don't have to worry about it because we secured everything at the entry and exit. What we've seen over the last few years is as you go multi-data center, as you go public cloud, as you go public-private, these network topologies get more and more complicated. And so you go from a single drawbridge to two drawbridges to 10 drawbridges, and at some point you really have no idea how many drawbridges there are anymore because you have mobile devices that are on the corporate VPN that's linked back to the sort of prod fabric, and so it's almost impossible to even understand what the network topology looks like. And so this starts changing that assumption where before we said, you know what, we can just say, if you're in our network, everything is secure, we don't have to worry about it. To now we have to rethink this a little bit. We have to actually consider that, you know, really we have to protect the infrastructure even if you're on our network. Our applications should not assume that you're authorized, that you can do things just because you're on the network, right? We've learned that this is sort of a fatal assumption, uh, and we can see these fatal assumptions sort of in the news all the time. And so with Vault, what we really think about is, OK, how do we start solving this? How do we change the assumption of security? And then what do we need to do to address it? And there's really three totally different axes that we see. The first one, which is really where Vault started life, was secret management, was looking at things like database credentials, API keys, TLS certificates. How do we securely distribute these things to our application if we're no longer hard coding it in the app or storing it in plain text? We really need to have sort of a more sophisticated automation around how we manage and distribute those things. And so that's really what we mean when we talk about secret management is how do we get these sensitive credentials to our applications that need them in the data center? Then when we started thinking about this problem and really building out the secret management side of things, it became clear that one type of secret, a very special type of secret, was encryption keys. Right? On the surface, it's not that different from any other type of secret. It's just a short string with some bits. But then what became clear is if we treated it like a first class concept and we sort of thought about it in a different way, then all of a sudden we could provide these much higher level APIs. We could think about keys as things that we're versioning. We can provide high level encryption APIs, decryption, HMAC, all sorts of sort of cryptographic operations. And so it goes from just thinking about it's a string that we have to hold to it's the sort of first class encryption as a service tool. So that we don't have to worry about implementing cryptography correctly in our end applications. Instead, we can just call out to Vault, which is doing it for us. And so once we got this far along, you know, then the question became, well, why do we have these two different sources of truth? One system for our human operators, one system for our applications. How do we keep these things in sync? This is just sort of you know, both bad practice from a security standpoint and introduces a possibility that we're not going to do things right. So how do we centralize everything? And so this became the next axis for us, which was how do we do privilege access management and make sure that the system is easy to use for our human operators who need to interface with it? 
So that is a lot of things to tackle, three totally different kinds of sub-problems. Uh, and so over the last year, we've been incredibly busy on the, in the Vault team, uh, adding all sorts of new features and capabilities to better do all three of those things. Right? And so we don't have time to go over all of these things. You know, I think one of the ones that, that was most exciting over the last year was the ability to have uh, secure plugins so that we can really continue down that mission of there should be a single way to broker access to these secrets regardless of the backend technology. So you know, while we can add support, and we are adding support all the time for new clouds and new databases and new systems, the plugins let us really extend that last mile to just about everything. And now I'd like to welcome Dan McTeer on the stage from Adobe to talk about how they're using Vault in their environment. Hey everybody, I'm Dan McTeer. Glad to be here. Um, every time I'm in a situation like this, I'm reminded of a poor life choice I made in college. Uh, we had to take public speaking. It was a required class, which I think is a great idea. The semester that I signed up for it, they happened to be offering it online. Um, <laughs> so in spite of understanding the irony behind that, I went ahead and signed up anyway. Um, so I'm going to dig really deep into all those experiences I've never had and use those to my advantage today. So I work for Adobe Digital Marketing. Um, for those who aren't familiar with that, uh, we actually process over 100 trillion transactions every year for our customers. More than 2 thirds of Fortune 50 companies are our customers, and that includes um, eight of the top 10 internet retailers, all of the top 10 commercial banks, um, all of the major automotive industry um, manufacturers. So we have a pretty big customer base, um, pretty critical uh, things going on. Our customers exist in just about every market and every industry you can imagine. Uh, in 2016, we provided a report that predicted the, uh, the online sales for Thanksgiving and Black Friday and Cyber Monday within 99% accuracy. Um, so we have, we have our hands in a lot, of, a lot of different stuff going on online. Um, if you've ever been onto um, like a major TV premiere, uh, cable provider um, it, channel like uh, HBO or something like that, and ask for your cable provider, that's one of our products. Uh, if you've ever um, streamed the Super Bowl on a mobile device, also one of our products. So our product suite is made up of more than 23 different digital marketing tools. And those are built and maintained and operated by over 50 different teams, developers, operations staff. Uh, and those teams, we, we, we like to embrace diversity, right, at, at Adobe. Um, we, we do a really great job of that. But part of that includes everybody having their own opinion about what tool works best um, and, and using all of those tools to manage our day-to-day -day work. Um, so those products run on a foundation of more than 100,000 hosts all over the world uh, in four major regions, and they span across to Azure, AWS, and Adobe data centers. My team uh, is part of a larger organization that provides core central shared services for all of digital marketing. That includes things like DNS, Git, uh, DHCP. My team in particular provides security-related services, so things like LDAP, Splunk, um, Vault, obviously. So the opportunity for sprawl in situations like this is, is just off the charts. Um, there are so many different tools to use in the different clouds, different open source tools available. You can have one piece of information over here and a completely different piece of information over here. How do you keep those things in sync? In sync? And on top of that, we are constantly fighting the battle of um, you know, people have so much time to do certain things, security requirements, compliance requirements across all these different industries that we have to abide by, uh, make it difficult for our operational staff to, to kind of keep up sometimes. Uh, so our team philosophy is that we take on the brunt of the security and compliance requirement work, but we make sure our services are easy to consume, are flexible, um, so that other teams can spend a lot of the time focusing on the customer um, on the operational side. So we're always looking for tools that 
like I said, are flexible, are easy to use, have a REST API. REST API is key because everybody has different configuration management tools. Everybody has processes they follow. Um, we want to make sure that those things are also simple to deploy. So any market we pop up in, um, we, we can be ready to go in, in a matter of hours with, our, with the services that we provide. So the choice was simple from our perspective. We've had tools that are um, industry leaders in secret management um, deployed at different parts of Adobe. Um, Vault Enterprise was the clear decision for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's great to see the message today that um, how agnostic these tools are, how many different places they fit into, um, and, and Vault is obviously no exception to that. So we have clusters deployed in four major regions across the globe. Each of those regions has three, uh, at least three Vault clusters, one in AWS, one in Azure, and one in an Adobe Data Center. And those are all linked together by an underlying network fabric. If you have questions about that um, later on, please feel free to talk to me. Um, this has done a number of things for us that have just been fantastic. Uh, a couple years ago when I started working at Adobe, we had a, a secret, a, a privileged account password rotation process that would take sometimes two to three hours every time we would rotate the password. With the implementation of Vault um, across the globe and, and some updates to those processes, we've cut that down to about 30 seconds every time we rotate those passwords. Uh, and when you're talking about thousands of hosts, tens of thousands of hosts, that's a huge deal. Um, not only that, we've integrated that with our, um, our Bastion host solution so that you can do privilege escalation. Again, this is all super easy to do because of the flexible REST API. Um, and then whether our, our users are accessing from Southeast Asia and Azure, or US East One and AWS, or an Adobe Data Center, everything will be the same. It's all standard. There's no having to guess what's going to happen in any given region based on, on, on what you're pulling, right? So. Um, so standardization has been key. Replication in Vault Enterprise has been key to our deployment. Uh, and then, of course, our, our auditors and our security people are super giddy about the information that gets provided in the audit logs. Um, there, are, there are so many positive things that we've seen um, just in the four or five months that we've had uh, Vault Enterprise deployed to production. Uh, my marriage has improved. My kids respect me now. Thank you. It's a fantastic product. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Um, later on today, uh, 520, I believe, Chandler Alfin, our, our primary vault deployment engineer and uh, manager of that service, will be speaking on track A. So please you know, come by and see his presentation. Come talk to us. Ask his questions. We'd love to answer questions. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I'll uh, welcome Marmont back on the stage. So. Can we just give uh, Dan one more quick round of applause? Thank you so much, Dan, for coming and sharing that with us. So earlier this year, we started working with our friends at Google, many of whom are actually here. So thank you to the Google folks for being here and supporting us. But we started engaging with them earlier this year on sort of advancing Vault's core mission, which is how do we support the users wherever they want to be? Our goal is really to look at providing a secure workflow to secure your infrastructure and your applications without being prescriptive about where you're running. So we're always listening to users and community members to understand where do you want Vault to run? Where is it not working well for you? And something we heard over and over was, please add support for the GCP platform. So we started working with our friends at Google, and they've helped us to implement the Google IAM Auth backend, which we launched earlier this year. And that's been awesome. So today, I'm super excited that we get to talk about working with those same group of folks to add native support for Kubernetes. Probably right behind everybody asking us for GCP support has been everybody asking us uh, for Kubernetes support for Vault. Um, and so this is something that we've spent some time prototyping and spiking and working with the community to understand how to best do this. Uh, and we're really excited that you know, we feel the implementation we got to is sort of the simplest and best of all worlds. So just to talk really briefly about how it actually works, now when you launch an application with Kubernetes, 
it's able to get a native Kubernetes service JWT token. With the Kubernetes auth backend, we're able to take that token and provide it to Vault. Vault will then locally do a cryptographic verification to make sure this token matches the role, this token uh, is originating from the Kubernetes cluster, uh, and that we have a strong guarantee that you know, this service is who it claims. Then we go even further than that and call back into the Kubernetes API. Once we've done that check to verify this token hasn't been revoked, it hasn't expired, it hasn't been deleted for some reason. And once all this is done, then Vault will generate an auth token and provide it back to the service that is scoped down to exactly that service's role and configuration. And at this point, the service has a native Vault token. So it's able to directly communicate with Vault's API, make use of everything from static secret management, dynamic database passwords, encryption offload. It's not intermediated. The app can do anything that Vault really supports. And so what we really, really like about this integration is it removes a bunch of intermediate moving pieces. You don't have to worry about anything in between the Kubernetes API and Vault. There's nothing between the service and Vault. Everything is direct, and there's a native integration. And so we're super excited about how that ended up working. So this is landing in Vault 0.83. That's going to be available today or later today. So please download it, check it out. And I think one of the important takeaways is that you know, this is part of our ongoing effort to work more closely with the Kubernetes community. Earlier this year, uh, if you're a Terraform user, uh, hopefully you saw we announced the native Kubernetes provider, which has support for the most common resources, and we're continuing to expand support for that. And so this effort is part of that as well, as we try and expand our support for Kubernetes across the portfolio. So I think you're going to see a lot more from us in that, and we'll talk about that as it shows up. <laughs>